The book of Boba Fett chapter 3 is out and it's full of new story elements from one scene to the next. Welcome back everyone, I'm Gerald and I'm a Star Wars fanatic. If you're new here, you know what, I'm not going to beg for subscribers anymore. If you like what I do, the option is available to you. If you like the video, show that by hitting the thumbs up. Now, on with today's topic. Today I'll be reviewing the Book of Boba Fett Chapter 3, The Streets of Mos Espa. I'll give a spoiler-filled review first, a count of my theories that this episode revealed is either correct or incorrect, and the comment shout-out that I promised to do for the previous video. So this is your warning. There are spoilers ahead for The Book of Boba Fett Chapter 3, The Streets of Mos Espa. If you haven't seen it, don't blame me if you stick around and you're spoiled. Near the end of this video, I'll talk about which of my theories came true and which ones don't seem likely. But let's get on with it. In this episode, the flashbacks are cut to a minimum, but with only a 38 minute runtime, it seems that they are trying to move more into the present time of Boba Fett's tenure as Daimyo of Mos Espa. There are some actor cameos and even a character cameo. The episode begins with the Bomar monk scurrying across the screen outside Boba Fett's palace. I mean, let's be honest, it isn't Jabba's palace anymore. But showing the monk is a subtle reminder of who the palace really belongs to, and it isn't really a palace either. It's a monastery. Like I've said before, everything in Star Wars has meaning, from the smallest of details to the biggest. There's a backstory or a side story to be had from everything. Anyways, back to it. The scene then changes to the inside of the throne room where Boba Fett and Fennec Shand are being briefed by Jabba's former torture droid 8D8, voiced by Matt Berry of What We Do in the Shadows. The droid is updating Boba and Fennec as to which crime families control which sectors of the Mos Espa city centers. He goes on about the Trandoshans, the Aquelish, and the Klaatuenians and their sectors. Sort of the way Berlin, Germany was split up into sectors following World War II. What the briefing boiled down to was that Bib Fortuna didn't have the power to control all of Mos Espa, the way Jabba the Hutt did. So he relied on these other factions to control their sectors while paying B Bib Fortuna tribute. In turn, Bib Fortuna then lined the pockets of Mayor Mok Shais, therefore explaining the tensions with the Mayor and Boba Fett. The briefing is then interrupted by Milton from Office Space. Played by Steven Root. No, his character name in the book of Boba Fett isn't Milton. He's just some local watermonger. His interruption was to ask for the lawlessness in the streets to be stopped. It seems that ever since Boba Fett has taken over, the streets have been overrun with crime. The merchant promises to pay double the tribute if this is taken care of. Yes, the water salesman seems to have tried to manipulate Boba. When Boba and Finnick investigate, they find out that an out-of-work scooter gang is behind the rash of thefts in the area. Like I said, there's meaning behind everything. I hope these colorful scooters have good meaning. Probably not, though. It's probably a contrast of color to all the browns and tans we see throughout the show, which in itself has meaning. But back to it. Boba Fett offers the scooter gang jobs and he pays a third of what they stole to the watermonger. Moving along, we then pan back to Boba's palace where he's enjoying another back to bath. And we all know what that means. Flashback time. Again, it starts with Boba as a child watching as his father Jango Fett departs Kamino on the Slave One. Then another flash to Boba leaving the Tuscan tribe to negotiate business with the local Pike Syndicate. The Pikes tell him they will not pay tribute to the Tuscans and the Nikto Bike Gang from Episode 2. Boba tells them he'll resolve this matter and returns to the Tuscan village, where he finds everyone has been killed. The marking on one of the tents suggests the Bike Gang was responsible. Boba then burns the bodies, and I would assume this is when he decides to go get his armor. And I'm not going to lie, I teared up a little bit when I saw the dead Tuscans but I didn't see the female warrior among the dead. Not seeing the children isn't as big a deal because it's Star Wars. They didn't actually show Anakin kill younglings either, but we knew it happened. Suddenly, Boba sleeps interrupted by a furry hand grabbing him and slinging him around like he's nothing. The furry hand belongs to Black Kersantan, and he's dedicated to killing Boba Fett while Boba is still in his undies. All of Boba's henchmen arrive, and BK is captured and thrown into the empty Sarlacc pit. 
Directly following the attack, the Hutt twins show up and apologize for trying to kill him using Black Kersantan. They give him a rancor and machete in good faith. No, not a machete. The guy machete, played by Danny Trejo. Ugh, let me explain. Machete isn't a Star Wars character. He's a character from another franchise played by Danny Trejo. Mr. Trejo is playing a Rancor trainer. I was trying to make a joke. Sorry. Boba then tries to return BK to the Huts, but they basically say, keep him. That they are leaving Tatooine for good, and he should do the same. There are bigger powers than both of them at play, and that the mayor, Makshais, is behind it all. Boba, Finnick, and the Scooter Gang all head to pay a visit to the mayor, but the mayor isn't around. Finnick then threatens the Twi'lek Major Domo again, and the coward runs. The Scooter Gang then goes after him in a slow street chase, stops him, and the Major Domo cracks like an egg. The mayor is off meeting with the Pikes. Boba sends one of the Scooter Kids to investigate and confirms the Pikes are indeed in town. That's where the episode ends. Yes, I left out some details, but just to make the synopsis a little quicker, this is a spoiler-heavy review, but sometimes replaying every event in the episode can be boring, especially if you've seen it. Not that the show is boring, but I'm sure you'd rather watch it than get a play-by-play -play from me. You want to hear my thoughts on it, so let's get to that. Overall, I really enjoyed this episode. I'm sure some of the aesthetics chosen were for good reason. The flashiness of the hover Vespas that the Scooter Gang used probably shows their own inner insecurities being made up for by their cybernetics and brightly colored hover scooters. Seeing Black Kersantan do what we know he could do was a real treat. George Lucas wasn't a fan of bringing characters into live action that were created in the written material. So, if he still owned the franchise, BK would still be sitting on the pages of the Darth Vader and Dr. Aphra comics if George Lucas allowed those comics to be created at all. But these new creators are showing their skills in intertwining the stories of live action and the print media. I mean, how many of you wanted to see Thrawn in something other than novels? Well, that was Dave Filoni that added him to Star Wars Rebels. The same Dave Filoni who has worked on The Mandalorian and The Book of Boba Fett. So I would expect more of this in the show and others to follow. When Milton, you know, the watermonger, first mentioned the cybernetic prosthetics, I wondered if this Vespa gang was being headed up by Bylert Valance, but that doesn't seem to be the case. I'm glad he isn't. The Rancor moments were also a nice treat. We learned so much more about the ugly beast than anything we had seen before, such as they form attachments to the first human they see, and they become loyal to their owners. They're actually deeply emotional and sensitive creatures. This adds so much to the Star Wars lore of the Dathomirian beasts. The mention of the Night Sisters riding the Rancors was also a nice throwback. I really look forward to more of the Rancor moments, but if there really are only four episodes remaining, we may not get much. So don't be too disappointed. The additions of Danny Trejo and Steven Root were nice as well. I mean, who else could tame a Rancor if not Malakali, 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 whatever, the original Rancor trainer guy. It could only be Machete. And we can now assume what would have culminated in Machete Kills Again in Space had it been released. Yes, that's the sequel to Machete. A nice gesture. This is a land in need of a hero. They call him Machete. Machete. Come on with the echo, echo, echo. Also in the background of Mos Espa was Amy Sedaris' character, Pelimato from The Mandalorian. You know, the lady on Tatooine who had the three pit droids and seemed to overact every scene she was in? Not that she was a bad character. Just tone it down a bit, lady. Okay, so for the third episode of The Book of Boba Fett, like I said, I really enjoyed it. Even though it had a shorter runtime, it got the story moving forward more in the present day. And I know a lot of people will be happy about that. Me, I like the flashbacks, but I'll get to that at another time. But this episode didn't have much downtime. There seemed to be something going on. Even when it would slow down, it would be interrupted to go into more high-stakes criminal bossing. The story is building nicely, and I ask everyone to continue being patient. There's a lot of important stuff building up here. I give this episode a 9 out of 10. 
points taken off for the flashy scooters. Sorry, not a huge fan of them. But maybe they'll grow on me. I'd like to take off points for Black Chrysanthemum's weird exit, but I don't think we've seen the last of him. Even though he's kind of a dick, he's still kind of a Wookiee as well. And Wookiees take it very deeply when their lives are saved or spared. Now, for my predictions and theory counts. I'll admit I was wrong about the character played by Sophie Thatcher. She does have a cybernetic arm and does not seem to be Boba Fett's daughter, Aelin Vell. At least not right now. Oh well, I can't get them all right. Sometimes it's wishful thinking on my part when I see one clip of a scene. I hope it to be a character that I'd like to see. But oh well, maybe one day. But it also doesn't look like she knows Terrace Cassie in any way at all. So that would rule her out as Arden Lynn as well. One of the characters from the 1990s video game Masters of Terrace Cassie. I'll also admit that it seems I'm wrong about Boba Fett recruiting the Mandalorian himself, Din Djarin, to help him battle the Huts. If the Hut twins have conceded, then that prediction won't be coming true either. But maybe I was only half wrong. The Huts left, but the Pikes are now showing to be the big bads of the show. And Boba will most likely still need help from Mando and his colleagues. The one prediction I did get right was a big one, though. I'll link that prediction video in the description and at the end of this video. The Tuscans were murdered. Yes, the symbol on the tent was that of the bike gang that Boba kicked the crap out of in the previous episode at Tashi Station. But it's revealed that the bike gang is being paid protection money from who? The Pikes. So, it's the Pikes who are responsible for the murder of the Tuscans that took in Boba Fett. The Tuscans he came to respect and probably even considered living out his days with. But yes, I predicted this after episode 2, The Tribes of Tatooine. So I got one out of those three predictions and theories right. I'll update that when we see if Din Djarin shows up to help with the Pikes. But I would imagine that won't happen until episode 6 or 7. And now on to the moment you've all been waiting for. The top comment from the last video titled, So, this isn't your Boba Fett. Here's why that sounds absurd. This top comment isn't one of heartfelt appreciation. Instead, I'm calling you out for your sexism and racism. So you all know, I won't engage with these types of comments in the comment section. Instead, I'll call them out for the ignorance they show. What's the comment, you ask? Well, I quote, only a mindless consumer can defend this hollow vehicle for corporate wokeism. It gives the epithet normie a whole new dimension. End quote. Okay, here's my response to that, genius. Congratulations, you know how to copy and paste other people's thoughts you find on the internet. So not only are you unoriginal in your thought, but you're also a sexist and a bigot. The world's population is made up of 50% women, and people of color outnumber those deemed as white or of European descent. Keep your ignorance and hate out of my Star Wars. This isn't the 1960s. You probably aren't even a Star Wars fan anyway. Just someone who hates women and people of color being put into lead roles. So, I'll leave your comment on that video for all to see, and I encourage everyone to call this person out for it. I won't stand for this type of behavior. Now, with that out of the way, what did you think of the episode? I'd love to hear from you in the comments below. I'll take the best comment and give a shout out to the one who posted it. And like I said in the beginning, I'm not going to beg for subscribers anymore. I'll leave that choice up to you. I would appreciate a thumbs up if you like this video though. It does help get my content out into the world. Thank you for watching. And remember, this is the way, the only way.